Hello and welcome to our webinar today on the environmental risk assessment in the food chain. My name is Bridget John. I'm with the International Association for Impact Assessment, or IAIA, and IAI is hosting the webinar today. Just a bit of housekeeping before I turn it over to our presenters. Uh, we are recording the webinar today and uh, we will be making the slides available after the event. And uh, the slides are also available. Uh, you will see them in the handout section in your control panel. Uh, if for some reason you are unable to access them, please feel free to email me and I will be happy to send them to you. We will be accepting questions at the end of the webinar. Please feel free to type them in as we go along. Ben Cave will be moderating those questions and will be um, posing those at the end of the webinar. So feel free to type in your questions in the control panel at any time, uh, as well as at the end, and we will handle as many questions as we can at the end of the event. So at this, I will turn the presentation over to our presenters. Uh, Jean-Roger Mercier has a long and rich track record in the preparation, management, review, and expertise of ESIA, as well as capacity building in Africa for ESIA preparation, review, and management, and he's spent many years at the World Bank. Assisting him today is Ben Cave, who has over 20 years experience in health impact assessment and environmental assessment. He's worked with the public and private sector across a range of professional fields, um, across Europe and in the U.S., Asia, and Africa. Jean Roger, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Bridget, and uh, welcome, uh, everybody. Um, the topic um, I volunteered today is uh, environmental risk assessment in the food chain, and uh, there are basically two reasons why I chose the topic. One. Um, I wanted to help um, prime the pump of uh, looking at uh, European topics for IAIA with a longer term vision of trying to see how much we could establish a virtual European branch. So uh, a focus on European institutions uh, seemed to be to, to me to be um, of the order. The second reason is uh, one of the things I think will be useful in these webinars is to explore what I call the margins or the boundaries of uh, traditional impact assessment. And uh, here in particular, um, I wanted to uh, share, um, Ben Cave and I uh, wanted to share with you uh, the experience we've had with two workshops we uh, organized and facilitated on environmental risk assessment, which is a very uh, specific process of um, of an agency that uh, many of you may not have heard about, which is called the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA. So um, <clears throat> we will uh, quickly go through uh, uh, a number of slides uh, that will explain, first of all, what the ERA process uh, looks like, what the EFSA uh, does, um, what is the broader uh, program, uh, so-called BTSF, Better Training for Safer Food uh, program that uh, the ERA workshops were part of, uh, just a minute part of a huge uh, program. Uh, the lessons learned from the workshops we held in uh, Rome and Tallinn uh, a year ago or so. Um, there are two more workshops coming up one in Rome and one in Lisbon uh, during the winter of uh, this, this coming winter. What were the lessons learned from the workshops and uh, what is the way forward on the virtual European branch and, and the takeaway lessons from the ERA for IA practitioners. Um, next. Um, the ERA process is one of eight uh, risk assessments that are performed to ensure that a product in the food chain is safe, quote unquote, for the European consumer and its environment. It's, it's a very logical process. Um, it has common features with environmental and social impact assessment, but of course the topic and the object of the assessment is different because here what we're looking at is assessing a product 
or, or at the limit of a service, but not assessing a project or an investment or an activity. Um, there are other, uh, many other uh, methodological uh, differences between uh, impact assessment and ERA, but we'll, we'll come to it when we um, move along. Next. The European Food Safety Authority, um, you have the website. On the website, you can see a very interesting uh, three-minute uh, video uh, presentation of ERA, e e ERA, which I haven't included because uh, we all already had quite an overloaded uh, agenda. But you can uh, see that um, video, and it will give you uh, some basics about uh, environmental risk assessment, which can be a complement, if you will, to this uh, webinar. EFSA was created in the early two seven, uh, two, 2000s. Um, there was a white paper on food safety in Europe uh, calling the attention of decision makers on the fuel risks uh, in the food chain uh, in Europe, not just from uh, domestic uh, food production, but also from imported uh, food, uh, included pesticide residues, uh, uh, GMO uh, presence, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a group uh, established in Parma, Italy, uh, that is the EFSA. It has a strong regulatory role on products in the food chain uh, in Europe, and it limits itself, uh, quote unquote, to assessing the risks, because the risks are managed and communicated uh, by uh, member states and by the European Commission. So it, it's a purely um, advisory, independent advisory role that the EFSA is, uh, is playing. Next. Now, EFSA and uh, the European Commission have launched uh, a huge training program called Better Training for Safer Food, um, BTSF. Uh, it includes conventional face-to-face -face, uh, training with e-learning. There are 35 categories of courses for uh, European uh, Union countries, seven categories of courses for third countries. Um, and there's an eight-module course on risk assessment this module being just one of the um, courses. And among the courses on risk assessment, uh, ERA is just one of the um, courses. There's a legal basis. And those of you who are uh, interested in legal basis uh, will be able to click on the slide and see the regulation that dates back to 2004. And um, and what it uh, what it says about uh, the legal uh, basis for the <coughs> sorry for uh, EFSA and uh, risk assessment. Next, the objectives of uh, BTSF are extremely ambitious. Um, they want to help ensure and maintain a high level of con consumer protection of animal health. Uh, animal welfare is one of the objectives. It tries to improve and harmonize official controls in EU countries, uh, ensure the safety of food imports, harmonize control procedures, um, and uh, help build confidence in a model um, that's hopefully a model for the world of uh, European uh, regulations that protect the um, consumer, the environment, and animals um, better. The, I, I, I want to um, insist, um, if you will, that EFSA in this particular context is playing a kind of a federal government uh, role. Uh, each uh, of the member countries, um, each of the 28 so far, and soon to be 27 countries, have their own uh, regulatory bodies and uh, assessing bodies on uh, risk assessment and food chain and so on. But EFSA is supposed to bring uh, together the best uh, expertise, if you will, and be the umbrella for uh, conducting a series of uh, assessments. And, and part of the training is to help uh, disseminate, if you will, 
the methods and, and approaches that EFSA is uh, uh, testing and, and using on a daily uh, basis. Next. Okay, like I said, uh, there are eight risk assessment courses as part of this very broad and very ambitious uh, Better Training for Safer Food uh, program. There's a microbiological risk assessment, chemical risk assessment, pest risk assessment, risk assessment in nutrition, uh, in GMOs and other biotechnologies, uh, risk assessment applied to animal welfare, risk assessment uh, for animal health, and what we will be describing is environmental risk assessment and the two workshops that were held. Just in passing, um, I want to mention that organize, just getting organized for the two workshops uh, was a bit of a nightmare in the sense that uh, the Commission and EFSA had been extremely strict on the composition of the training team and we had to have five trainers uh, from three different European countries. And it took a lot of back and forth um, until we selected the cream of the cream uh, because we had uh, Ben Cave and, and two uh, French ladies and, and a Greek lady who is the overall uh, chief and, and team leader for that, uh, for, for that team. I will, I will comment a little bit when I show the, the agenda for, for the training. Next. What does ERA perform? Um, typically, ERA is one of the many tools and assessments that are used when a private firm uh, requests uh, a European approval for a new product on the market or for importing an existing uh, product. The request is processed at the national level and EFSA gives an independent advice to the European Commission. That advice is based on the passing of a series of tests and risk assessment of which ERA is one. And here are, um, here is the overall uh, picture, if you will. Um, people have called it either from fork um, to, uh, to, the, to the plate or, or from the stable to the table. Um, ERA and the other risk assessments take uh, a full cycle uh, view of what's happening uh, between the uh, production of food or import of food and uh, the consumer. Um, and of course, uh, a lot of the ERA focus is on the upstream part of the cycle because um, it deals with issues like uh, what happens if you um, have pesticides in the farm or what happens if you have a GMO uh, organism that uh, gets into um, the wild and, and spreads the genes and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but, but the view is a view of the full cycle, including production, transport, uh, retail, sale, and even uh, consumption of uh, food uh, in Europe. Next. Now, the workshop agenda will give us the opportunity to uh, describe a little bit what the approach is and uh, how it connects to um, environmental and social uh, impact assessment. Um, it's, Eugenia Chahidevstu uh, is the Greek uh, lady who is the team leader. She's, uh, she's a very uh, respected professional in uh, ERA. And she's actually, of the five trainers, the only one who performs uh, ERA on a routine basis from her uh, institute in uh, Athens in, uh, in Greece. And uh, the rest of us uh, actually could be split a little bit in two uh, categories. Um, Bain and, 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 uh, and Sophie were the kind of uh, health impact assessment uh, experts. And I and Agnes were more the environmental impact assessment uh, or ESIA um, experts um, and the team uh, worked quite well together by combining our um, complementarities, if you, if you will. So the first session had to do with the goals, the protection goals um, that were uh, included in the environmental risk assessment. This is a very, very important uh, step because uh, depending on the goals, 
um, the method uh, falls in place um, because the risks are measured, if you will, um, as, as a proportion of the goals that want to be attained um, in, in environmental and social uh, terms. Um, I was presenting the problem formulation steps which, as you will see uh, later, are very logical uh, steps uh, trying to break down um, the environmental risk assessment into um, pieces that people can uh, grasp. Um, and uh, Sophie was, uh, was presenting uh, also. Uh, next. <coughs> um, we, we injected a lot of uh, breakout group uh, exercises, uh, some of them going as far as simulating, uh, if you will, uh, meetings between a, a private company trying to put uh, a pesticide on the market, uh, the risk assessors and the risk uh, managers, and uh, actually Ben uh, himself gave a, a great uh, show uh, doing this simulation exercise and people were actually thrilled of um, getting into real life uh, situations. Uh, one of one of the key uh, one of the key um, differences, if you will, between impact assessment and uh, ERA is uh, jargon. Um, there, there's a very specific jargon in uh, ERA that uh, some of us in the IA uh, sphere are not entirely uh, familiar with. And uh, for instance, um, assessment endpoints. Um, assessment endpoints. Um, are actually environmental uh, parameters and environmental goods that you're trying to uh, protect or on which you uh, try to avoid uh, harm. And uh, it took me a while also to understand what non-target organisms uh, were, but um, in this context, non-target organisms are uh, the organisms that may be affected by, say, uh, a pesticide that's meant to uh, kill a specific uh, breed of uh, pests, but um, can be affected. And uh, the classical example is bees, uh, where you destroy bees and their uh, habitat and, and ecosystem, whereas you're trying to kill some form or shape of um, you know, real pest. Um, environmental exposure uh, was presented by Agnes is, and is actually very close to what people are doing in environmental impact assessment, except it's much more at the kind of laboratory and the micro level, uh, whereas we in the IA uh, sphere, if you will, have uh, more a tendency to take a territory, um, territorial approach. Um, life stage analysis, I will make a few um, comments on life stage analysis because it's in the same vein of uh, being prescriptive about the kind of um, test uh, that people do uh, that will affect different uh, life uh, stages like uh, larvae or adult population so that there can be a decent uh, scientific projection of the impact, uh, potential impact at least, or risks on, um, on non-target uh, organisms. Uh, that, that's pretty much the content, if you will, of the, of, of the training. The rest is, you know, whatever you do in, in this kind of uh, training, like evaluation and uh, case studies and so on and so forth. Next. Um, like I said, there are some key concepts. Um, hazard, uh, stressor, uh, risks. Um, these concepts are not very, are not very different uh, from the concepts that we use in um, environmental and social impact assessment. Um, next. Now, one thing that's really important uh, to realize is that uh, risk assessment, uh, like I said, of which environmental risk assessment is just uh, one of the eight uh, processes, is only one of the key phases of uh, what uh, the Commission and EFSA call risk analysis because the broader picture takes uh, not just uh, risk assessment, um, including hazard identification and characterization, uh, exposure assessment, risk uh, characterization, but also risk management, which is typically undertaken by ministries in the countries and uh, the European Commission at the European level, 
where people uh, have uh, you know policy alternatives that they weigh and, and decide which one is the best um, and and in particular of course you know this whole issue of uh, labeling and of authorizing some products on the market uh, there was a big um, there was a big uh, polemic uh, there was a big um, uh, discussion um, that you may have seen as citizens uh, about um, a, a series of products called neonicotinides uh, that have an impact on uh, on bees, um, an, an, an unintended impact on, on bees, and uh, there's been a lot of um, controversy, if you will, uh, around the, the risk assessments that had been performed to uh, decide whether these risk assessments were conservative enough or uh, scoping enough um, of the non-target organisms, uh, for instance. But then. Risk analysis also includes uh, risk uh, communication because once uh, risk assessors and risk managers have been agreeing on what to do with a given uh, product, then there's a used, strong need for uh, you know getting into um, the issue of communicating to the larger uh, public um, what what the risks, uh, the, what the residual uh, risks, uh, if you will, uh, are. Next. So this is this is the very broad brush um, and the very easy to to understand uh, scheme where um, hazard um, has to be characterized um, the uh, physical chemical or biological agent that's uh, supposed to have uh, potential risk uh, adverse uh, effects uh, is characterized. Um, and people look at uh, the adverse effects. If it's on human population and human activities, it's, it's more uh, taken um, into consideration by uh, the other uh, risk assessments. But if it's uh, soil, water, natural species, and habitats, it's typically what the ERA uh, does. So there is a risk characterization that uh, blends all the eight uh, risk assessments that have been uh, conducted and all of this results into an advice to the risk managers. Next. Now, in, in graphic terms, there's no um, magic bullet, if you will. There's no um, um, revolution in, in uh, intellectual approaches to a, a subject li like this. Um, the importance is to frame the problem. Um, the risk of what, to whom, where, and when, um, developing a conceptual model, uh, planning the risk assessment, and, and screening and prioritizing the risk to be assessed. Now, this is the kind of you know um, second grade uh, approach to the to the problem. Uh, whatever the assessment uh, that needs to be conducted. Uh, next. So let's 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 get into uh, vignettes, if you will, of, uh, from the presentations uh, at the at the workshop. The, the workshops, each of them was uh, four days long. So um, I won't uh, I won't show you the kind of 400 or, or 500 uh, slides that we were presenting, but just a few selected um, slides, if you wish, to illustrate uh, the approach. The overall framework, um, it's, it's a circular way of, of showing um, what I was showing in a linear way. It comes out of a very interesting publication of the UK government, which is prefaced by, um, uh, by my, my former uh, director. Um, his name escapes me uh, right now, but um, um, Robert uh, something. Uh, anyhow, um, it's it's a well uh, recommended uh, reading. Uh, Green leaves uh, three, and uh, and you will have the the link um, for those of you who get the the slides. Um, but interestingly enough, you know one of the one of the gimmicks we used uh, during the workshop that really worked well was to ask uh, participants to uh, debrief us uh, every morning about what had been coming up uh, the previous day. And here we had an Irish uh, participant with uh, a Scottish lady, I think, who uh, presented us with this fantastic uh, graph. And um, he said, OK, ERA is trying to look at uh, environmental risk. 
And environmental risk is very broad and very fuzzy and very, you know, quite uh, wide. But the way people finesse the complexity of the problem is to focus on a specific question that's uh, represented by the red square. And although we cannot cover all the environmental risks because there are too many non-target organisms, there are too many, you know, complex mechanisms uh, behind uh, the causal uh, relationship, then uh, with one specific question we're trying to uh, serve uh, the European cons consumer and, and farmers at best. Um, next. And this specific question can be, you know, uh, either uh, reasonably broad or, or focused. Um, in terms of selecting the non-target uh, organisms, it's always important to keep in mind uh, some species have um, uh, certain uh, features. Uh, there are the umbrella species at, uh, at the end of the food chain, uh, but there are also some, um, you know, the, the issue of uh, public uh, perception is also very important. So sometimes uh, a keynote species like uh, bees, for instance, um, can have to be um, included in, in the sample just because of, uh, of public uh, communication uh, issues. Uh, indicator species, you know, other species. Next. Like I said, the issue of uh, life stage is really important because uh, the vulnerability, if you will, of uh, non-target organisms um, can be sometimes and is very often on the reproduction, for instance, of, uh, of animals, either because the breeding grounds are uh, polluted or because the larvae or the young um, adults uh, are particularly um, vulnerable and, and fragile um, expo when exposed to uh, evil products um, like uh, like some of the worst uh, pesticides. Uh, next. So there are some very complex uh, life stage analyses uh, that are conducted and the uh, EFSA uh, is actually playing a key role in uh, identifying what are the databases, what are the methods, what are the approaches that uh, give the best, uh, the best results. Next. For instance, in the process of, uh, of uh, doing the preparation of the training workshops, we identified the number of uh, databases that could be used and that can also actually be used, obviously, by IA practitioners um, to describe uh, what is the, uh, for instance, the typical growth um, rate uh, or measurements of, uh, of an adult uh, bee, for instance, uh, when, when not exposed to, uh, to, uh, to a hazard um, and, uh, and uh, other, uh, other approaches, obviously, um, are much closer to the IA approach, uh, like the source pathway re receptors, which is something that we're using uh, all the time because it's the logical uh, way of doing things. Uh, next, um, it, it's something that we've already, you know, more or less uh, seen. Next. Uh, the evidence uh, that's uh, gathered uh, for the ERA um, is, is uh, really important uh, because the, the level of resources that's needed to do a, a correct uh, environmental uh, risk assessment covering the whole uh, waterfront uh, can be, uh, you know, um, impressive and, and, uh, and, and uh, scary in, in a sense. Next. So you will you will see a number of uh, more recent uh, legal uh, legal requirements. Um, as you know, uh, anything that has to do with European and Commission and, and Europe um, is very heavy on uh, on legal requirements. And uh, the latest uh, trend, you know, the latest uh, EU directive on uh, environmental assessment of uh, projects is, is no exception to to that uh, rule. Next. Now, just a very brief uh, nutshell description of the two workshops. Um, 
the first workshop was actually the dry run because uh, it's uh, it's a team of trainers that had never worked uh, together. So um, uh, on the Sunday evening before the workshop, uh, some of us were slightly nervous. Um, it all went uh, extremely well. We had 25 participants, both from EU member states and from non-EU uh, states. Um, for instance, Macedonia, uh, a combination of risk analysts and risk uh, managers, uh, very diverse uh, academic background. Actually, in that first workshop, we had a quasi-majority of uh, veterinarians, but we also had a lot of uh, chemists and biochemists. Um, the program included uh, lectures and group uh, case studies, uh, and like I said, there was a bit of fun even at the end because we, we needed it to uh, wind, uh, unwind, if you will. At the Tallinn workshop, Tallinn is in Estonia, that's what I found out when I um, you know, um, flew there. Um, was a second delivery, um, was slightly more relaxed because we knew that the first uh, time had gone well. There was a slight disappointment both from EFSA and from us on the limited number of participants, maybe for lack of uh, communication. Uh, very few changes in the curriculum and in presenters' material. Uh, the EFSA officer who was there was extremely cooperative and happy, and so the success of the two workshops uh, called for a repeat of uh, two additional uh, workshops, probably one in January, one in February. The lessons learned from the workshops, uh, ERA is a very complex but also a very formatted approach. Uh, performing a good and useful ERA requires a strong scientific background and a vast array of knowledge of uh, various uh, topics. Um, data requirements for the preparation and conduct are huge and diverse. Um, national level uh, methods and techniques are usually uh, one uh, notch, if you will, below uh, the sophisticated approach of EFSA. And there was a bit of pushback actually by some participants who were saying that there would not be, like in the former Yugoslavia, for instance, in, uh, in Tallinn, uh, saying they would never, never, ever have the resources required to do a, a, a job uh, that would be anywhere close to uh, what the FSA was doing. Um, as, uh, as an individual and, and uh, professional in IA, I feel that ERA is a necessary but not sufficient approach to good risk management and communication. Um, I think that uh, a bit of combination with a more uh, territorial approach uh, would not uh, hurt and uh, a bit more uh, diversity, if you will, in the profiles of the people um, cooperating into um, ERA. Um, what's, what's the interest and relevance for IIA members? Um, knowing fully well that one of the, you know, uh, <clears throat> one of the ideas I had in the back of my mind by doing this presentation was also to present you with a new um, European institution, EFSA, that you might never have heard about before, uh, like I had before I joined the, the band. Um, many of the data requirements for ERA have a lot in common with, with what uh, IA experts require for a good EIA. Uh, the social factors are out of the scope of ERA, but present in other risk assessments. Um, Impact assessment focuses on project and activity. ERA focuses on products, uh, okay, uh, and sometimes services, like I said. Um, IA experts are uh, often faced with the same issues of communication and enforcement as ERA experts are. Um, the same logics of uh, searching for causal relationships applies to both uh, IA and ERA alike. Um, and when uh, IA deals with projects touching on the agribusiness in general, like was described in the full cycle, um, the outcome of ERA of projects having gone through uh, the ERA process uh, should probably be used in the impact and risk analysis uh, sections of the ERA. Now the last, uh, the last but one slide is um, courtesy Agnes, uh, who is one of the presenters in the team. And she, um, you know, calculated and, and, and displayed um, the fact that uh, ERA uh, should probably in the future uh, be calling upon many more uh, specialties uh, as it does for the time being. Now, just one last word 
about uh, the potential for uh, next slide, sorry, uh, Bridget. Um, you know, the <laughs> just just a little bit of uh, propaganda for a, a, a virtual environmental uh, European branch of IIA. Um, there's a possibility that the European Investment Bank might be seduced and, and convinced into delivering on the mechanisms that uh, the European institutions like uh, Ombudsman, EIB Complaints Mechanism have built and maintained to allow simple citizens to protect their rights. Um, EIB is planning um, a workshop in Montreal, but maybe they will do a webinar this uh, January or February. And, uh, you know, my motto is IEIA is got talents. Um, so if any of the participants want to uh, take up the challenge and use the IEIA webinar facilities to spread the word uh, among smart people about their research, um, and then, you know, who is the next Susan Boyle of uh, impact assessment in Europe is, a, is an open question to which uh, Ben probably has answers. Thank you. Bridget? Now we will turn it over to Ben. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type them into your question um, taskbar on the control panel, and uh, we would be happy to answer any that you might have. Ben, do you have anything that you would like to add? Um, thank you, Bridget. No, apart from saying hello to people, um, I would like to uh, I suppose echo the points that Jean Roger has made in that um, from the point of view of doing impact assessment on development projects, um, it was very, it has been very interesting to get involved in this work on environmental risk analysis, which is looking at products. Um, as the skills are very transferable, um, and I think learning from one form of impact assessment um, can inform and throw useful light on other forms of impact assessment. Um, and the issues that came up were, were very much around uh, risk analysis, risk management, and risk communication, um, and how they could be taken through. Uh, and the tensions between uh, regulatory bodies and um, private sector companies, in this case, looking to advance um, a particular product, and also with um, the end users. So that might be with farmers or with vet veterinarians. Uh, um, the, the, the specifics and the, and the vocabulary and the language was different um, at, at or, or it differed at particular points, and Jean Roger provided some examples of that. Um, but the, <laughs> excuse me, the, the 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 processes were very similar, and that um, in itself is uh, very instructive. Um, there has been a question come through as to how many um, how many people are on the webinar. Um, so there is. Um, there is a way well, I can tell that we have 53 people are on the webinar. That's an answer there. That's a, the question from Sue George, and the answer is that there are 53 people attending, um, and that does not include Jean Roger, myself, and Bridget. Um, I would be very interested if, if anybody else has any questions which have um, ab about environmental risk assessment or or. Um, experience of working on environmental risk assessment, um, please feel free to pose those via the, um, the, the question panel. Um, Maya if, Ortiz. If Celine. I may, um, Ben and, and uh, Bridget, I see that Celine Lopez, who was one of the participants in Tallinn, uh, was one of the attendees. Um, if Celine wants to, um, you know, testify um, in writing or whatever, um, her experience, uh, I think that would be also interesting. Other than that, I don't see many questions. Um, there were some comments. Um, there's one from Mexico. Indeed. From Mara Ortiz saying, here is one from Mexico. I don't know if there's a question following. 
or if you're saying as a participant from Mexico, in which case, very welcome. Here we go. Okay. Well, if anyone has any additional questions um, that they think of afterwards, please feel free to email myself and I will pass them along to Ben and Jean Roger and uh, we can share them with the participants as well if, if they're interested. As I mentioned before, this is being recorded so the audio will be made available. You'll be receiving a follow-up email and there will be a link to that at the end. The slides are also available in the handout section of the control panel or if you missed those, please feel free to send me an email afterwards. Finally, there is a two-question, very brief survey uh, as you are leaving the webinar. Um, please please do take just a quick moment to answer those two quick questions. It's, uh, one of the questions is where everybody is from, what country you are residing in. It's very helpful for us to know uh, who is participating today.